You're watching Scriptees. In today's episode, we'll be examining the role of punctuation in screenplays by focusing on the script for Zombieland. You can expect spoilers for the whole film. Punctuation is one of the most basic tools available to a screenwriter, or any writer for that matter. It may not be as sexy as word choice, but punctuation has a subtle way of slipping right past the reader's conscious mind and dipping into the reader's subconscious. Punctuation in its most basic form provides clarity. It separates out ideas into digestible chunks of subjects, actions, and objects. New sentences in screenplays typically mean a new idea to communicate, and that idea often requires a new shot. Whether that be a new setting, an important object, or a character's movement, punctuation demarks the idea the filmmaker wants to convey in that moment. But what I find far more interesting for screenwriting is punctuation's ability to control pace. Think about it like this. When reading out loud, punctuation marks often inform the speaker when to take a breath. They provide pauses in speech. These pauses not only allow the speaker to take a breath so they don't pass out, but they also allow the listener to process the information they've just heard. In other words, pauses allow for reflection. Wielded correctly, you can use punctuation to change how quickly your script is read and, consequently, how the reader interprets a given moment. I'm going to speak in massively broad terms here to make a clear, memorable point, but let's say that there are two types of punctuation when it comes to controlling pace. Contemplative punctuation and spurring punctuation. Contemplative punctuation slows the reader down, getting them to reflect on the character's motivation, ponder the film's themes, or anticipate what will come next. This includes full stops, question marks, and ellipses. Spurring punctuation pushes the reader forward. It hooks the reader into the unfolding action, hypes up a big moment, and breaks tension. This usually includes commas, exclamation marks, and dashes. Changing which type of punctuation you use for a given moment will alter the reader's experience. When we use ellipses to bridge between turns in the action, and load the action text with full stops to create short sentences, each moment is distinct, they step into one another. The action is methodical. Now let's look at the same sequence, but with commas and dashes. Now the text reads faster, and becomes more hectic as a result. The action feels panicked. In camera terms, contemplative punctuation feels like a series of controlled shots, whereas spurring punctuation feels like a tracking shot that might use shaky cam. I really do believe this effect is incredibly powerful, even if the reader isn't actively aware of it. It's kind of like how music in a video game can be altered to change the player's mindset. There's a great video by Daryl Talks Games on the topic, I'll leave a link down below to check it out. One of the examples provided shows how a player can approach a puzzle in a game differently depending on the music being played. Higher frequency music primes the player's mind for concrete thinking, considering the immediate utility of the objects in front of them, how they work together, etc. Lower frequency music, however, switches the player's mind into abstract thinking, looking at the larger picture, considering associations with past information, etc. By changing the music the player is exposed to, you can prepare them for the type of solution necessary to solve the puzzle at hand. In the same way, by altering the punctuation you use for a given moment, you can change how the reader perceives that moment in their imagination. Horror and action films are great for examining punctuation use. They often need to switch between tense, creeping moments and hectic action sequences. Since it's almost Halloween, let's take a look at the script for Zombieland to see this philosophy in practice. Let's start with full stops. I know you usually finish with full stops, but that's the wacky kind of guy I am. Now of course, full stops still have their common uses like creating acronyms. VO, POV, DC. Full stops can also be used to abbreviate words. You'll see that a lot in screenplays, as every interior and exterior is abbreviated to int and ext. But for now, I just want to focus on the full stop's primary role, creating sentences. As stated earlier, a sentence contains a complete thought. Something does something to something else. At the end of the sentence, we get a full stop that signals us to pause, comprehend that action, then move on to the next complete thought. Now of course when we're reading we don't look off into the distance every time we hit a full stop, but even the briefest of pauses is enough to let the preceding words sink in. Zombieland is full of chase scenes with ravenous zombies, yet screenwriters Rhett Reese and Paul Wernick skillfully use punctuation to keep the action clear when necessary. In this scene, Flagstaff is trapped in his apartment with a zombie called 406. The action is segmented into sentences that each describe one action by either Flagstaff or 406. 
Their spatial relation to one another is key in communicating the slapstick nature of this scene. If the action is too jumbled, it'll be hard for the reader to imagine what the fight looks like. Flagstaff backs away, then he sprints into the dining room, then he tries knocking furniture in 406's way, then he threatens her with a blender, then he drops it and runs. Like I said, one sentence equals one action. Of course, when I recount the action, it sounds kind of boring, but the deliberate pace of the action is supplemented by other techniques. Strong word choice, such as sprint madly and bum rushes, and comic description to break up the action. When we talk about commas later, we'll contrast this methodical breakdown of action with more hectic, flowing action. Full stops can also be used with increased regularity to create emphasis. Short, punchy, strong. This technique gets across strong feelings in a short span of time. Zombieland opens with two examples that set the tone quickly. The opening song is catchy, patriotic, warm, but the opening sequence is described as gritty, kinetic, fast, scary. It's a no-nonsense technique that grabs the audience's attention. Let's move on to question marks? Sorry, let's move on to question marks. Question marks aren't too fancy. If your sentence is a question, you chuck a question mark at the end of it. 95% of the time you're using question marks in a script will be in dialogue. One person asks another person a question. However, there are some neat little ways to weave questions into your action text. The first is voicing a character's decision-making process. Essentially, you're asking the question that the character is asking themselves to show a choice that character must make. Stories are built on difficult decisions, and this technique conveys the protagonist's choice to the reader. In Zombieland, this technique is used for comic effect. Flagstaff wakes up on the couch completely confused before coming face to face with his zombified neighbor. Or later in the same scene, when Flagstaff runs through his disappointing list of improvised weapons. You can also pose a question directly to the reader. It's kind of goofy, but if you know your audience well enough, it can really bring them closer to your story. In Zombieland, we're asked, ever see the gunfight in the movie Heat? Which, if you have seen it, hypes you up for the following sequence. It's calling on a positive emotion you already have and asking you to associate it with this next scene. Or in this scene, where the question is played for comedic effect, undermining the expectations of the genre. The movie is unabashedly acknowledging that it's a movie, which is great for a zombie comedy like Zombieland. And then we have the most versatile contemplative punctuation mark. The ellipsis. The ellipsis is generally used to indicate an unfinished thought. Whereas the full stop allows for reflection on a sentence, the ellipsis asks the reader to ponder what comes next. The most common use of the ellipsis is to build tension, have a potentially dangerous setup, then pay it off on the next line. Zombieland pokes fun at this technique as Albuquerque opens the Twinkie truck. Ominous violins swell. We can also build hype using this technique, which makes sense because when you think about it, hype is just excited tension. As Flagstaff and Albuquerque prepare to run down a mob of zombies, we get a series of ellipses. The engine revs up, the tires spin, the car gains speed, all before the actual collisions. This setup payoff structure works for revealing important plot points and character details too. The reveal of zombified Patrick Swayze is preceded by an ellipsis, plus a whole lot of build-up that adds to the reveal's humor. Early on, we get this line, which perfectly captures Flagstaff's personality. We aren't watching a hero here, we're watching a coward. The ellipsis, plus offsetting the conclusion of the line, reinforces this moment in the reader's mind and establishes Flagstaff's major flaw. In dialogue, the ellipsis is commonly used to show hesitation or consideration. It could indicate an awkwardly bumbling, anxiety-ridden guy like Flagstaff. I am a good helper of looking through boxes. This technique gets thrown around in dialogue a lot, and since it's so common, it should be wielded carefully to avoid being cliché. It pops up in every genre. Maybe it's a cop procedural and you need someone's line to trail off while they consider all the clues. Or maybe it's a drama where the character is just about to confess what they really feel, but they stop short and look away. Or it can just be used to show that someone is out of breath. This stuff doesn't always have to be so complicated. Ellipses are also great for creating despair. This trailing idea lets the sadness of the thought sink in. Something like, and the American dream is lost, just looks better with an ellipsis at the end. Or it can be used in dialogue for the same effect. This land was made for you and me. I particularly love the way this technique is used later in the script for Zombieland, when Flagstaff finally realizes that Albuquerque's buck wasn't his dog, but his son. Albuquerque's face reveals untold pain. 
It gives the reader a chance to dwell on that realization before transitioning to the flashbacks of Albuquerque and Buck. Oof. Okay, that's too sad. Let's switch it up and chat about our choice of spurring punctuation. First up, we have the comma. The comma retains its common uses, like making lists, separating names and titles, and preceding speech in text. Of these three uses, you're almost never going to see the third use since you're not writing a novel. All speech is going to be in dialogue, so very rarely will you have quotation marks in your action text. Commas are often used to string together actions so they flow into one another. Remember, commas are shorter breaths than full stops. This leads to continuous, fast-paced action. The first page of Zombieland opens with some excellent comma use. A classic question to ask in zombie movies is, what type of zombies are we dealing with? Shambling or sprinting? This section answers the question whilst creating a vivid image of the zombie's crazy nature. If full stops and short sentences create emphasis, then commas and run-on sentences de-emphasize the importance of each component clause. We see this multiple times during the film's climactic scene. The action is so quick here that rapid cuts of small actions combine to make one larger, more important action. I think this last example is the strongest. The overall idea is simple. Albuquerque pulls out the gas pump. But the added commas here allow all the requisite actions justifying the gas pump's use to happen quickly so that the reader understands what's happening. EXCLAMATION MARKS! Sorry about that, but it did grab your attention, right? Exclamation marks aren't too complicated. Use them when you want to show intensity. This could be in dialogue, where exclamation marks no urgency or shouting, though this should be used carefully. Much like capitalization, overuse of exclamation marks desensitizes the reader to their effect. And of course, in action text, you can combine exclamation marks with sound effects to make them loud. You'll notice when you type an onomatopoeia and follow it with an exclamation mark, you'll get a rush of endorphins. Try to suppress this feeling. Loading your screenplays with sound effects doesn't make your story interesting, in the same way beatboxing doesn't make for good conversation. Another classic use of the exclamation mark is to indicate a sudden action. This could be a sound effect, of course, but it doesn't have to be. It could instead be a zombie celebrity from the 80s attacking someone. But once again, it doesn't have to be. And then, final punctuation mark, I promise, we have dashes. Dashes are a little more complex than I first gave them credit for, and I myself tend to supplant them with commas or parentheses. But trust me on this, if you learn how to utilize your dashes, you're one step closer to being a master screenwriter. Dashes come in three types, hyphens, n dashes, and m dashes. Hyphens are what you probably picture when I talk about dashes. They're used to combine words together, like these examples, or to add prefixes to words, like in non-hyphenated. Huh. And of course, you'll see them all over screenplays, since they separate the location in your scene heading from the time of day. N dashes are slightly longer than hyphens, and are commonly used to denote a range of numbers. For example, the 07 to 08 financial year was rough for the global economy. I had to sell about 50 to 60 crates of Girl Scout cookies to get by. Of course, being an adult male, I was swiftly arrested and sentenced to 5 to 8 years in jail. About 75 to 80% of you are tired of this joke already. M dashes are perhaps the most interesting of the three types in their utility, sometimes represented in screenplays as a double hyphen. While the ellipsis lets a thought linger, the M dash instead pushes the reader into the next thought by removing finality from the current thought. Unfortunately, though I do love the script for Zombieland, the screenwriters seem to have an aversion to M dashes. So let's look at some other horror screenplays for examples. The most obvious use of M dashes is aposiopesis, or more simply, interruption. I considered not explaining the term aposiopesis, thus flexing my intellectual superiority and sending you grumbling to Google so you could catch up to me, but then I realized the awkward way I say aposiopesis would tip my hand, revealing that I have never used the word before in my life. Anyway, aposiopesis is common in dialogue when someone gets cut off, like these examples from Nightmare on Elm Street. We can also use it in action text when something suddenly appears, or when we have a sudden cut. In both cases, the M dash represents an unfinished thought, and the reader's mind seeks a conclusion in the next line before reflecting. Using this same method, the M dash can be used to prevent the reader from releasing their tension. Whereas the ellipsis built tension by getting the reader to anticipate what comes next, the M dash prevents the already pent up tension from being released. Sentences ending with M dashes used back to back cut into one another, preventing the reader from pausing. The ring uses M dashes liberally to ratchet up the nervous tension, 
As Katie ventures upstairs to find Becca, each motion and thought is cut off. You're waiting for the release of the tension that's been building during the whole opening sequence, for something to jump out, but we get denied the final scream as it's cut off. M dashes can also be used to quickly separate out thoughts. A series of shots is the most explicit use of this technique, using M dashes like dot points to clearly communicate each shot in turn. We can see this in the opening sequence of A Nightmare on Elm Street, where Wes Craven constructs a frightening image of Freddy by showing him in parts. But the technique can also be woven into action text, setting off an explanatory clause to expand on an idea or character's emotions. In the script for It Follows, we can see this technique at play. You can use it to show how someone views something, how someone does something, or even just how someone accessorizes. Apparently the guy who wrote this script, David Robert Mitchell, thinks you can just do this multiple times on every single page of your screenplay. But hey, what do I know, maybe he's right. The film did win a bunch of awards, although not a single one for best screenplay I noticed. My personal opinion is that good punctuation is a bit like good editing. When it's done right, you don't even notice it. It acts on the reader's subconscious, invisibly passing right by their defenses. You want to put a question mark and an exclamation mark right next to each other? Sure, go ahead you crazy animal, but use it sparingly and the impact it has on your reader will be far stronger. Next time you're writing, think about how your punctuation influences the reader. Is it giving them time to think about the film, or is it drawing them into the sensory stimulation of the unfolding action? By balancing these forces appropriately, you can give your writing texture and keep the reader engaged. Good writing and good luck.